Yeah. Wirecast on. Share screen. I have no Awesome. Okay. So it should be working. Sweet. Okay. Welcome to the second installment of Lexton's <laughs> church live stream. Live screen. Live stream. Live stream. Live stream. Live stream template. So in the last episode, we uh, set all this up. Uh, we have all five of our VCAs where you can click and unclick uh, the channels, which is very, very nice. Um, it just keeps everything organized. And when you're trying to find something, you know exactly where it is at all times. <laughs> But now we're going to start talking about system processing. And system processing, I, as I said it a lot in the last video, I don't know if I explained myself. System processing is the method of using audio effects on each channel to get the most desired, desired, oh my gosh, give me a second, sorry. The most desired effects for your, or the most desired sound for your mix. And this is where a lot of the creative process happens. Um, and also it's where a lot of latency happens and you have to be very, very careful with how you treat latency, especially on a live stream. But to start, we're gonna go into tracks right here. And we're only going to be mixing in this mixer. So there's no, there's no reason why you should go to this screen or the main screen. I mean, you can, but to streamline your effectiveness and minimize your time doing this, I would stick to the mixer. So the first thing, I mean, I kind of went over all of this. Um, setting is your presets. Very, very nice, especially when you're just starting, because once you have everything that you want, you can save it as a preset. And then every time, let's say you do this at another church, um, you can call and you store your presets onto a hard drive. You can literally just plug in um, your hard drive into Logic or whatever. I think it's only Logic that you can do it in, but you can just recall that setting to this input or to this channel strip, and therefore you have it all at all times. Um, second, gain reduction. That's compressor limiter I'll show you. What that looks like, EQ is a parametric EQ. This is your input, which is how Dante sends to whatever it is. This is your audio effect. So we're gonna be spending most of our time in this little row right here. These are your sends. We set those up last video. Uh, this is your output. So ST out just means stereo out. I like to see, see it as straight out. It's kind of easier for me to process what's going on in my head. So when I see ST, it means stereo, but I like to say it, I like to hear it as straight out. Uh, your group, we, are, we already set up groups. I mean, another way to do it that I just found out is to go here, do a group one. And that way, when you're affecting any group, you guys, you can just know when you first look at it, it's a group. Um, I just like it this way, but whatever you want to do, whatever makes it easiest. Automation is just basically how this is going into like when you record it into the main window. This is how you can do automation to basically take knobs or faders and make them follow a certain path. Uh, we won't really get into this in these videos, but when you're not live mixing, this is very, very good. This just shows you what type of track it is. So these are all audio tracks. There's, on Logic, you have a software instrument, you have drum instruments. This will kind of show you what it is. With this, it has a little knob just like this. Um, it just kind of tells you this is a bus. With this, this is panning. Panning is if you want, let's say I get a, a a, let's say a sound into this channel strip. If I want it all the way to the left, I can pan it all the way to the left. If I want it all the way to the right, I can pan it all the way to the right. 
to reset it, you just double click it, backspace zero, and I'll set it, reset it. Um, these are your faders. This is what makes, this is what made, I guess, audio production famous, <laughs> is the faders. Uh, this is basically just your volume. Um, you never want to go above zero. And so the reason why you never want to go above zero is because that involves digital artifacts or clipping. What digital artifacts are is that those are the pops or clicks um, in your mix. So basically, if there's a lot of pops or a lot of clicks in, that you find in, in your live stream, it's not the latency, so to say, but it is the amount of gain applied to your streaming to your master so if this let's say my master's all the way up right here and this is all the way up right here this is going to sound like a train is running over it and you do not want that you also get clipping which is clipping is when you get distortion because of your gain is so loud so let's say you don't get clicks or pops but you get this thing that's very it's like gritty it's very um how do you say very crunchy and very, it almost sounds like a blown out speaker at maximum volume, which is basically what it is in, in essence. Um, you don't want that. You always want your master to be zero or lower. And that just comes with pre-gaining everything and making sure that you really pay attention to your audio effects. So with Tracks, Tracks is coming through Multi-Tracks. It's a company that uh, Jesus Church has subscribed to. It's basically, they have rights from CCLI, which is a Christian licensing corporation. It's basically a PRO, which means a um, public rights, pub, PRO is a public rights organization. Um, few commonly known ones are BMI or ASCAP. They're kind of the main leads on secular music, but for sacred music or Christian music, they use CCLI and CCLI has different laws and regulations to their music. Basically, if it is a worship, if it's a worship song and you buy a CCLI license, um, churches have the right to use the worship songs, but not in a commercial sense. So you can't make for CCLI, you can't make any money off of it commercially. Um, and with BMI or ASCAP, you cannot make any money on it at all. So you can use for CCLI, you can use non-commercial. It's a non-commercial license. So going into tracks, these are what we get. So let's say we want a Bethel music song or let's say a million times, right? By Hillsong, Hillsong United. Um, they're going to send us the tracks, right? We pull them from multi-tracks. They're already mixed and mastered. So there's no really reason to put any EQ or audio effects on there. If you want to, you can add compressors to it just to make it, just to make sure that there's no transients or very high, um, very high starts to the sound. But in all essence, I mean, those tracks were mixed by a mixing professional and a mastering professional and I, I am not there yet on my journey. So I'm not going to touch that. All I'm gonna do is um, basically mess with the volume and make sure that it is at the right volume that I want for my mix. So we're gonna leave these, it's called, it's called dry. So we're gonna leave all of these dry, which means there are no system processing. So it's just gonna go straight in and straight out into the fader. Second is you have your pastor, pastor microphones. For crowds, this should be stereo because you should have two crowd mics. If you don't, you can just leave it mono. Um, I don't put anything on my crowds. You can, however, put a like CLA-2A, which is a waves uh, compressor. It's very, very nice. It has a 1970s, 1980s feel to it. I usually go analog, which is I go around 50 hertz. The gain is around 40 to 50, but it's depending on how you process your crowds. For peak reduction, you want it very high because let's say 
the pastor's preaching and you want the crowds to the crowd mics to pick up like the clapping and everything well let's say a kid walks in front of the mic and absolutely screams his head off you don't want that to go into the master and make you clip or make you have digital artifacts so what i do is i do i boost a lot of peak reduction of probably around 70 or 80 to make sure that the transience of the claps or child screaming will not ruin your live stream. So let's put that right there. Yes. That will blow out a mix even in the house. Yes. I'll go from 85 dB to like 102 every time this. I mean, it's like 100 plus people smacking their hands together. At the yeah. Same time. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it, it can get, really loud, really it can get fast. very loud. So that's why you kind of want to, you can either do a limiter. I like to do a compressor just because it sounds better to me. Um, you can do a limiter, which a limiter is basically, you set a volume level that you don't want the sound to go above. And it's basically, it basically does not make the sound go above that. Uh, you have to be really careful though. You can't set it too low or else you'll get very, very weird digital artifacts um, like clicking and popping or even like the sound going in and out because the computer can't process all this, all the um, sound going through it. Uh, for announcements, I like to do a CLA 2A. Um, this is kind of the same thing, 50 Hertz, I swear by it. Um, this is where, let's say you have a person come up after the first worship song and say what the church is doing. Um, he's going to be kind of excited just because he's the first guy talking in the service. So I usually gain it around 40. You can do 30 if you want, if he's a loud speaker um, and peak reduction around 60, 50 to 70. I usually put it around 60. Um, you also want a SSL channel or an EQ. I use SSL just because it's, um, it only has one millisecond of latency, which is absolutely amazing when live streaming. You also want to put the SSL first before you put the CLA. And the reason why is because you don't want, then SSL is an EQ. An EQ basically means an equalizer. So you're basically saying what frequencies you want boosted and what frequencies you want cut. And this is kind of how to do it. You don't want to put the CLA or you don't want to put the compressor before the SSL because this, the compressor will boost those frequencies that you don't want. So you want to get rid of them first. So what I like to do is this is your low cut. I want to put it around to around 175. Um, just because you don't want any of like these bass tones coming from the guy's voice because it will mud up the mix very, very easily. Um, this is going to be your top, um, your top EQ. This is a high frequency. I like to put it around five with a boost of three or five kilohertz with a boost of three decibels because from three to five is where you get the clarity in somebody's voice. Uh, this is medium high frequency. I like to put it around like 1,000 to 3,000. I usually do about two and I boost it just a little bit just to get those bass tones in there. This is gonna be your Q factor, which is basically you can see by these signs how small you want the bump or how big you want the hill. Um, with this, I kind of want around like 1.5 to two just to kind of get that, um, you don't want to boost all of the low frequency or all of the medium high frequencies because then it sounds like he's in a trash can and you really don't want that in a mix. Um, these are this is your low medium frequency. I usually boost. Actually, I usually cut around one. And I make it kind of a kind of a higher uh, hill or sorry, a less steep hill just because this is where this is where the mud happens in somebody's voice. And then for a low filter, I want this around 200. And th this is gonna be kind of a harder cut just because this is where it gets 
very bassy, bassy, and you really don't want the person talking to have that. So that's kind of how you walk through EQ. I mean, you can do this on a parametric EQ or even a graphic EQ. Um, if you're trying to find very specific frequencies, you want a graphic EQ. That's when you have 31 bands and faders. Um, a parametric EQ is like I showed you last time, it's this. You can kind of see where the frequencies are and then these will help you. Um, it's just a more visual tool, I guess, in the EQ form. So after you get that, we're gonna do the same thing with guests. So we're gonna put an SSL channel. I just walked you through it, so I'm not gonna do it again. And then a CLA 2A. I'm not gonna do that again because I showed you. And then for the passer, this is where your bread and butter is. So you really, really want the passer to sound as good as you can get it. You want them to sound like full hearted. You want them to sound basically like he's in a podcast without him being in a podcast. And that meaning is you want him to sound professional, but with the work of the crowd mics, it's not going to sound like an actual podcast or a closed door recording. So the first thing you want to do, of course, is your SSL channel. Make sure this is, each pastor is going to sound different. Make sure you spend a lot of time in the CQ just because your pastor needs to sound like butter. Um, if I can get this down. Second is a CLA 2A or a CLA 76. I like to do CLA 2A because it's more um, voice friendly. And then for uh, just, just for like, more effects you can do a de-esser i usually do the waves r de-esser which is right here and it looks like this this is going to be the threshold and every time he hits an s this is going to deep uh dip down which is basically going to get rid of those frequencies you want it around five, like 5.6, but it can go from 5,000 to 6,000. It's just in those range, ranges. You just kind of have to find it. This is your threshold. You kind of want it lower than 40. I usually put it at 45, um, just to make sure that it's catching those S's. And that is good for the pastor. So with instruments, um, this kind of, you just kind of have to go with your ear on this one. Every system processing is going to be different because I do not have the same keys you do. Coffee break. But this is kind of how you want to set it up first. And you want to do an SSL channel on everything. So how you do that is you hold shift, click it, highlight all of these tracks, go into here and click the SSL channel. That means it's going to put an SSL, an SSL channel or EQ or whatever you use on all of the uh, all of the highlighted channels. So with keys, that's kind of however you want to do. You can throw on a compressor or you can throw on a reverb or however you want it. I like my keys clean because that's kind of the full body of the track. Um, with bass, I usually do this thing called R base, which basically boosts in a very analog type of way, which means um, it gives it a lot of harmonic content within the bass frequencies. Um, this is called R base. This is made by waves. It's basically how intense you want the desired frequency. 80, 70 to 80 is usually where you want it. Then to boost this intensity, I usually put it around six, and then you can push the gain down to make it level again. It just makes your bass thicker and doesn't, you don't lose it in the mix. Think of this as if you're building a, let's say if you're building a skyscraper, your base is going to be the foundation, and you want the foundation to be heavy enough to where it doesn't topple the skyscraper, but you also don't want it to take up the first and second floor. Type of thing. So that's what I do for EG or for electric guitar. I usually do a CLA 2A. Again, I love it. It is amazing. Um, I swear by it. With acoustic guitar, uh, same thing. It's just 
trying to make sure that if let's say your electric guitarist is really heavy on the downstrokes, it's to make sure that it catches those transients or those um, very hard attack uh, type of sounds and make sure it's leveled. Same with acoustic guitar. I mean, definitely if they're plucking, you want to raise this gain. But if they're strumming and they're strumming hard, you want this peak reduction to be very, very pushed. Probably around 70, I would say. Dun, 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 dun. That is instruments. So vocals, this is where you get kind of interesting. I do my vocals very differently than a lot of people. Um, I try to not do repeating system processing. And the reason why, the, the reasoning I say that is yes, you need an SSL to be different or you need an EQ on every single one because every single EQ is going to be different because people have different voices. You can't just have a male EQ and put it on a small girl. Like it just won't work because then all those frequencies get lost. Uh, so all of these, all of this EQ is going to be different from each one. Um, but that is all we're going to put on the audio effects for system processing for the main vocals. And I'll show you why in a second. For drums, this is kind of just how you want to do it. Um, I usually put an SSL on all of these just to make sure like you really, the, the reason why we're using an SSL or an EQ is because you're gluing the mix together. You're taking out the frequencies that you don't want in each sound. And when you do that, it glues the mix together and makes it more tight. If that makes any sense, it makes it more, how do you explain that? Cohesive. Well, yeah, it makes it more cohesive. Instead of, instead of having a book of run on sentences, <laughs> It makes it streamlined so you can hear each sound and not get lost in the frequencies of each mix. Carve out little bits of what it into. Yeah, it's basically like puzzle pieces. Um, after you do that, I like to put a R bass on my kick out. Yeah. That's just like the bass you want that kick out to be thumping. So I usually put it around 80 to 90. You don't want the bass frequencies and the kick out frequencies to clash. You want the kick to have that attack. And that's how you get, that's, you don't want your low end to be muddy. And how it gets muddy is the kick out and the bass are hitting at the same frequency. And that's just, uh, you can't boost two of the same frequency or else it gets really, really muddy. So you really want this to be uh, separated just by like two or like 10, not two, about 10 hertz. Um, for kick, this is gonna be your attack on the kick. So this is where the kick gets its brightness. Snare top is where you get the thump of the snare. Snare bottom is where you get the rattling or the highs of the snare. High tom is self-explanatory, low tom self-explanatory. And the reason why we have two overheads is because I want this overhead, I want a stereo, a complete stereo image of the overheads to make it almost like a pad. So I pan these, as I talked about last in the last video, I pan these left, I pan this right. This way it makes for a broader stereo image of the mix and it helps it glue together. It just makes it more cohesive, I guess, in the best way to re-put it or put it. Uh, the first one is instrument reverb. This is the first uh, bus that I put in. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is the this is one of the this is the fourth bus I put in. But I'm only affecting the reverb of bus one of the electric guitar and the acoustic guitar. So what I do is I go into the audio effects and this can be any uh, reverb. I mean, I can put it, put on, I am a sucker for waves. So I'm going to put on, let's say, is it isotope? 
Well, let's put on room. I like room. This is an awesome reverb. It's made by Contact Instruments. It's amazing. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's very experimental, so you kind of have to be uh, careful with it. Careful with church. Yeah, careful with church. You don't want this. Yes, it, this is to get creative, but it's also to have a cohesive and comprehensive mix. You don't want it to be a rock band. Think of think of your grandma listening to music for the first time. That is kind of what you want to be. You don't want it to be all airy and very out of this world. You want it to be glued together. That is what we're doing is we're gluing it together. So for instrument reverb, I like to put the mix, I like an airy room. Um, I put it to around 7% and I turn down to the decay around 2.2 to 2.5. And then I high cut it. So that way, probably around 12. So that way there's no very high ringing that just stays. It's very like, it's a very watery sound, like a murky water sound. And I really, really like it. Yes. So that's, that's what I do for room. You can put an EQ after to make sure that um, you don't get really weird ringing frequencies and how you can go into that is graphic EQ and you can find it exactly and lower it. That's kind of the best way to do that. For Vox Reverb, we're gonna do the same thing. Room, I'm gonna put it around seven, probably five. Oh, okay. I want it. Yeah, I use, it's either realm or room. I like to say room. I'm gonna put it on the Vox Reverb. I, I personally, I use it for everything. I really like room. Um, it's, there's more control over it if that makes sense, rather than like your basic like computer reverb, I guess. So, and it's only, it's, I think it's only 50 bucks, which is in, I mean, in audio terms, it's not a lot. That's cheap. Yeah. So after we do this, I like to put it around 5% decay around three seconds. And then I like to low cut it. You do not, I don't like, the body of the vocals to be present in the reverb. So I cut it about right here and then I high cut it. Like I said, you don't want the ringing. So I put it around 12 kilohertz. Um, for the delay, I'm just going to pick a random delay. I think I have, let's see. I just have delay. Okay. so. We're going to put H delay on it. Um, and you want to put it to milliseconds. And the reason why is every song has a different tempo or BPM, meaning beats per minute. So you want to be able to take this and then tap it to, to the BPM in order for it to stick. You kind of want to go along quarter notes half notes are a bit too much so quarter notes is basically the main way to do that you can also throw on an eq to make sure it's good um for the overhead compressors i like a cla 76 which is up here this is a very um even though it's analog, I like to go bluey and 50 hertz. This is a very heavy hitting compressor, which means it it does it takes a lot of life out of it, but it also gives it a lot of harmonic content through saturation, which means it there's more color to the sound, I guess is the best way to put that. So you don't want to boost the input. You don't want to boost the output. You can if you're if you're not running it. If the overheads are too um, quiet, you can boost the output. Attack, I like to catch it really early. So I put it around 2.5. And the release, you want it to be very, very high because you almost want it to be um, almost like a shimmering sound for your overheads. 
for drum reverb, we're just going to do round. Um, I like to put it on grounded around 5%. You don't want a lot of, a lot of reverb on any of the sounds because the, this is when you put reverb on your mix, it think of it as exponential. Like the more, the more reverb you put, the more muddy it gets, but it sounds really good until it doesn't. So you really have to be really careful on how much you put into it for delay. I like to put it as a, as a low, probably around one second the reverb. I like to bring this, you know, that we're going to put it on all the way wet and I'll explain that to you after I set everything low cut. You don't want the drums or you don't want the kicks to get into the reverb. And then you don't want the overheads to be absolutely obliterated by the reverb. So I put the high cut down. And the reason why I go full wet on all of these is because this is your, what, okay, so wet and dry. So dry means you have no signal, you have no system processing, system processing coming through. And wet means you have system processing coming through. I want it all the way wet or all the way up. So that way I can tell the computer how much reverb and delay I want through the faders. It's very, very easy. It makes it organized. So let's say I have a main vocal. It's a very airy part. I want to usually start like this. I want to boost the reverb. I can just slide it up and it'll catch the main vocals and take it. Same with the delay. I'm going to reset these for my own sanity. Um, for track bus, you don't want anything on there. Okay, back up, sorry. So these are all the buses. This is going to be different system processing than what we've done before. These are all our effects buses, which means these are where the sounds go and then they go here, if that makes sense. So to look at it, it goes, the sounds go from here, oops, sorry, from these VCAs, to these vocal or to not vocal sends to these auxiliary sends or buses, and then these go to different buses over here, and this is where you get your final sound through all of these, and then this is where you can mess with your levels and how it, this is basically the gluing compound of your mix. So for track bus, you don't want any processing because tracks are already mixed by a professional. So you don't want to do anything. Pastor buses, um, I usually put a, a, very, a CLA 76 to make sure it's very, very hard, um, almost like a limiter. I turn the output down and I turn the input up. Attack, you want it very low. Release, you want it around two. I usually do a bluey analog 50 Hertz. This is, this is just another safeguard to making sure that there's no very hard transients in your mix and to make sure you don't clip for instrument buses. Um, I don't really put anything on my instrument bus. You can put an EQ or you can put a compressor to glue it even more. I don't really suggest it. I think you just kind of rock with, the um it's a live mix so you kind of want it to be as dry or sorry as organic as you can possibly get it that being the sounds coming in so i don't really put anything on my instrument but you can put a cla 76 or cla 2a or any other compressors to make sure that there's no crazy transients coming for vocal bus this is where it gets interesting so if we go back to vocals, I only put on an SSL channel. That is not enough for vocal processing. So what I do, instead of putting on every single system processing for every single channel, what I can do is I can go here. First thing I wanna do is do a CLA 2A. and then gain it around 40 to 50 with peak reduction around 60, just to make sure that it's all coming through at a good volume. Then I want a CLA 76 to make sure that it's not peaking at a crazy volume. So I want fast attack and a heavy release. 
with it being bluey and 50 hertz. Then I want a C6, which is basically a multi-band compressor. It just splits up a compressor and for, in four different slots. This is very complicated. It is not. Um, you can see right here, that is a compressor. This is a compressor. This is a compressor. Basically makes it more, I don't know, um, intricate in your compressing design. Um, basically, you just kind of have to mess around with this. I can't tell you a good starting point. You just kind of have to go with what sounds good. And then I put a deesser on it just to make sure that those S's aren't hitting very, very hard, which is going to be up here. Right there. Awesome. And then for drum bus, I usually put a Kramer on it, which is another compressor. It's all about compressors when trying to do live stream audio. You can, it's just kind of basic principle. You don't want the sounds to pop and click because you're trying to make sure that everything sounds good. It's pushed up all the way, not all the way, but it's pushed up to a good level to where it's gluing together, but you don't want any clicks and pops. A Kramer is a very, very good compressor for drums because it adds saturation to it, which basically just gives it more body and more color. Makes the drums more interesting also. Um, you just kind of have to mess with these knobs and just kind of figure out what's the best way to mix it. And that is the second installment of mixing. Basically, make it as uncomplicate, uncomplicated as you can for each mix. Like you're not doing a mixing you're not doing a mix for like a multi -bill a billionaire company. You're not doing a mix for a pop celebrity. You're doing a mix to where it sounds organic, but it's not so mixed that you lose the beautifulness of a live recording. And awesome.